When I got into Standard 10 years ago, the question of what constitutes a wincon was one with a single standout answer, Etherling. It was a control meta, no doubt. If you weren't playing a Devotion deck or attempting in vain to play green, you were playing one of the many variants of control, and you were almost certainly running one or two copies of Etherling as a way to close out the game. For a relatively new player, it was a comforting type of card. You input a bunch of mana and two or three turns, and in return, it reduces your opponent's life total to zero. So, that's what a win con is, right? Or maybe a win con is when my brother played an overwhelming stampede into a cluttered board state to cut through my modest suite of blockers like a hot knife through, I don't know, a handful of 4-4 vampires. Or maybe it was a win con when I played Angelic Gift on a 4-4 land at the Battle for Zendikar pre-release and smacked my opponent four times for the win. Above average two-man enchantment, honestly. Some might even call it a win con. We all come across the concept of a win condition somewhere along the line in our existences as Magic players. And this is for a reason. MTG's defense-friendly combat system and hand-emptying mana system means that it can't always be assumed that the game will end naturally, that there are all sorts of game situations that might sprawl out and demand some sort of remedy. There are lots of situations where the phrase win condition has a fairly understandable meaning. However, as with most pieces of terminology, it becomes a lot more challenging in Commander. Sextupling the life total of your opponents makes a lot of things challenging, to be honest. Not only does it take more to win an EDH game, but the concept of what winning means shifts wildly. Conventional EDH wisdom might have you gesturing at various things as a win con. Crater Hoof Behemoth is a win con. Torment of Hailfire is a win con. Perforos, God of the Forge, is a win con. Sanguine Bond is a win con. And sure, this classification does work on some level. There are lots of situations where these cards will win you the game, and they each gesture at a different plan for winning the game. But is this a useful category of card? I don't think it is. Anything can win a game. If your opponents play no cards, a 1-1 squirrel is a quality win con. If your opponents are playing nothing but archers and bears, a single siege dragon is a great win con. You shouldn't ask the question, what cards in my deck are the ones that win the game? Because the important question is, what cards in my deck are the ones that don't win the game? Now let me clarify that last statement. What I don't mean to say is that you should cram your deck full of big splashy bombs. Quite the opposite, even. Having too high a density of splash in your deck will leave you too little room for the building blocks that actually lead to victory. What I mean here is that if you're building a deck with the intent of winning a game of Commander, that goal should be present in some form or other throughout each and every one of your card choices. The number one criticism I have for people when they ask me to look at their deck, a criticism I give about half the time, is this looks unfocused. This phrase can mean a couple different things in practice, and to start thinking about those, it's useful to first lay out a framework for how EDH decks work. Fundamentally, most decks involve a system of inputs and outputs, with inputs being conditions that need to be met, and outputs being the results of those inputs that contribute to the deck's game plan. My Sharoom deck's primary inputs are Astral Slide and Cycling cards, and its primary outputs are Flickers, which allow Sharoom to recur large artifacts onto the board. My Mariadex primary inputs are Equipments, and its primary outputs are Mana, Value, and my Commander hitting your face for 14 damage. I could give more examples, but long story short, inputs and outputs are the name of the game for decks with any amount of synergy, and this framework itself points us to the two places a deck can stumble with regard to focus. It can have unfocused inputs, and it can have unfocused outputs. For an example of a deck with unfocused inputs, a viewer emailed me about their Missy deck that contained both Artifact Creature and Face Down Creature synergy packages, with a couple narrower sections of sub-synergies within these. Within the deck, there are the components to make some decently powerful board states, but the issue is that there are too many different types of card and ability present, and they don't really connect with each other outside of all being related to the commander in some form or other. Ultimately, a deck like this with unfocused inputs will naturally have a lot of dead draws and will struggle to put together a cohesive board state with any consistency. It's possible to build a deck that can pivot between a few different plans, but these decks are tricky to build and typically involve paying close attention to the points of connectivity between various types of card. Some examples of decks with unfocused outputs would be conventionally built variants of what I like to call value tribal commanders, and I'll use Gabby Nest Warden as an example since I've already talked about her before. Your average Gabby deck is pretty good at maintaining cycling-based value loops, but when we look at the actual payoffs for cycling, aside from draw, 
It's a lot of small token creation, some larger token creation, some soft creature removal, some incremental damage, some creatures getting bigger, and so on. Theoretically, you're getting a lot of stuff when you add the input of cycling, but those outputs are so diverse that these decks don't end up actually doing any one thing in particular. It's just a flood of generic Magic the Gathering gameplay. This is probably better than a deck with unfocused inputs, since it's actually doing something pretty consistently, but it's a generally toothless type of deck that will struggle to win against decks that have more refined win plans, even if those decks generate a smaller quantity of total resources. Both unfocused inputs and unfocused outputs are problems that will lead to challenges in ending the game, but for different reasons. Despite this, the solution to the two problems is pretty similar. You should be asking what each card in your deck does, how often it will fail to perform its intended function, and whether it contributes toward a cohesive plan for your deck. A common first step in building commander decks is to lump together a bunch of cards that synergize around a particular one or two things, and while this will lead to a deck that does do something, if you're trying to win games, it might take a bit of tuning beyond that to make sure the deck can actually make it to the finish line. And for a bit, I want to zoom in on a particular type of deck that often falls just a little short in this regard. Alright, so this is a transition point in a longer video where it might make sense to put a midroll ad, but I don't like midroll ads, so I don't run them on my videos. That said, if you like what I do and have a spare 3 bucks a month to support me in making high effort videos like this one, there's a link to my Patreon down in the description. As I was going through the EDH rec page for Gabby while writing the previous section, there was one standout exception to the lack of good options for closing out the game, that being Moonshaker Cavalry. The card is a brutally efficient finisher, capable of converting a board full of tokens into a bunch of dead opponents in short order, and its presence here gestures at a specific type of card, mass buff cards, whose usage could lead to a Gabby deck with a more definite identity. This brings me to the subject of midrange, which I'll define here as decks that want to get a big board of creatures and then attack with them. Now, I'm sure when playtesting we all like to imagine the ideal scenario for a beatdown deck. We play out a bunch of creatures, and swing into the big empty boards of our quivering hypothetical opponents. And this might occasionally be the case, but in most games, your opponents will have creatures as well, even if their deck isn't a purely midrange deck. So here, I'm going to introduce an important phrase, parity. Parity means a state of standstill, basically, and in the midrange context, it's usually when multiple players have decent sized boards, but can't swing in for large damage due to a lack of evasion or a risk of counterattack. In a game like this with multiple midrangey decks, we can divide the game into two key steps for a given player, create parity and break parity. Creating parity just means getting your beefy midrange board up and going and not falling behind. This sounds simple, and indeed, it's not too hard in the abstract, but there are lots of places to go wrong. You can fail to draw mana, fail to draw beaters, fail to draw the right combinations of beaters, and even if you succeed at these three things, you can still get board wiped or lose to a non-combat win con before you're able to do an adequate quantity of beating. For this reason, lands, ramp, draw, protection, and a varied mixture of creatures might all be parts of how you get into a state of parity with other decks. Breaking parity is where you do something to the board that allows you to deviate from the state of parity, which generally means letting your creatures hit for a lot of damage. The most popular parity breakers in Commander are overrun effects, but there are a myriad of other potential options. Targeted buffs, goad, extra combat spells, mass evasion spells, and cards that disable potential blockers, or even remove them altogether. I am on the record saying that Mass Calcify is the best evasion spell. Now, if I were to rank these in terms of raw power, the bigger overrun effects like Crater Hoof Behemoth and Finale of Devastation would be easily top of the pile, with Moonshaker Cavalry being a similarly powerful option in white. However, I'd argue that these are also probably the least interesting options as well, given how straightforward and hard to interact with they are, so if you're not playing at a super high power level, you should go with whatever parity breaker feels most appropriate to you. The important thing is that you should have at least something for this, some number of cards played with the goal of converting that cool board you worked hard to build up into a win. With all of that said, and to crib shamelessly from EDH Retcast, one challenge in navigating parity breakers is being able to distinguish a card that helps you win from a win more card. The goal of a parity breaker should be to turn a game state that's not quite winning into one that wins, but some cards will only win with a board state that was probably already about to win. 
For example, Epic Struggle wins the game outright if you have 20 or more creatures on your upkeep, but there are tons of cards that can win off of a board that massive, and most will be useful in situations with fewer creatures as well, rather than being a 4-mana enchantment with no text. Crucible of Fire is a less extreme example. It's an anthem for a creature type that's generally already quite big, and most dragon decks would probably be better served by running an additional dragon with useful abilities instead. Ultimately, the way to navigate these sorts of cards is just to think about all the situations in which a given card is useful, and also the situations where it's not useful. If something is a kinda dead card two-thirds of the time, that other third had better be really good. Parity also exists as a relevant concept outside of midrange decks, specifically for aggro and control decks. For an aggro deck, parity is what you want to avoid, and if your momentum does come to a bit of a stall as your opponents catch up on board, you at least want them to be low enough on life or other resources to be deeply uncomfortable in their position within the game. This is the general conceit of a lot of 60 card burn decks, throw creatures at your opponent's face until you can't anymore, and then hope you got your opponent low enough to finish them off with burn in time. Control, on the other hand, is similar to the classical mid-range parity plan in the sense that it's looking to create and then break it, but is very different in that control decks will often create parity by using board wipes or stacks pieces that slow down the table, and then break parity using carefully picked out cards that are less affected by these tools. Control decks are also typically chiefly worried about resource management. Compromises must be made between how scary the board is allowed to be and how many control spells are kept in hand for contingencies. For these reasons, control is sometimes easier to finish off opponents with than midrange, since small boards and suppressive methods mean that less potent finishers can still do the job, and that winning over the course of several turns is acceptable. You do still need to think about the deck's win plan, though, and balancing that with the deck's controlling elements is naturally going to be part of the challenge. On that note, let's talk about removal in a more general sense. Based on the amount of removal people seem to run in casual EDH, it seems like a lot of people might not be aware of this, but if one of your opponents wins the game, your odds of winning that game actually drop quite precipitously. You might have a bit of a hard time pulling off that W. So, seeing as how this is Snail's Guide to Winning an EDH Game, it is my duty to tell you that preventing your opponents from winning the game is an important concern that you shouldn't take lightly. However, despite my smartassery, I understand why people tend to run low removal counts. Let's assume for a moment that we're thinking about the archetypal removal spell, a spell that destroys a spooky thing on our opponent's board that may or may not lead to our demise if left unchecked. For every removal spell you add to your deck, you're increasing your ability to hinder your opponents, but you're also subtracting from slots available to bolster your own game plan. For this reason, you can think of these removal spells as being something that buys you time at a cost. As a side effect of this, faster decks won't need as many removal spells as slower decks, and I'm going to demonstrate why that is visually. Let's think about the amount of stuff that needs removing at a given moment. When I think of really spooky stuff that begins to happen in a game, it generally starts up small, where, say, 10% of the time there will be some potentially game-ending nonsense on a given turn, but things will pick up for the next few turns until you're at the point where there's going to be spooky stuff left and right. The timing and what exactly comprises potentially game-ending nonsense will vary with power level, but the basic concept stays fairly constant, and you can shift around this scale as needed. Let's say you're playing at a somewhat middling power level, where you're going to start seeing power plays trickling out around turn 5, with things getting really intense by turn 9 or so, assuming the game goes that long. If you're playing a faster deck, say one that's looking to start knocking down opponents around turn 6, there's a lot of stuff you simply won't need to deal with, because your opponents won't have time to fully develop it out before you're threatening lethal. By contrast, if you're playing a slower deck that's looking to develop a much more all-encompassing threat a bit later in the game, there's a good chance you'll need to contend with some threatening plays from your opponents before you're able to pull off your win, since player removal is not an option. You'll still want some ways to slow down your opponents in a faster deck, but you won't need nearly as many. Another consideration is that interaction isn't always just about stopping your opponent's win plans. It can also remove obstacles to your win plan. With a given Flame Slash, you could be killing your opponent's Volo Guide to Monsters to prevent them from doing some dumb shit with it, but you could also be deleting somebody's Glissa so you can swing at them with your offensively large attacker, or getting rid of their Archon of Ameria so you can have your ridiculous pop-off turn unimpeded. 
This sort of flexibility is also where counterspells really shine. You can always counter that Jingataxius or Turgrid, but you can also counter a board wipe or a removal spell lobbed at your key creature. I personally really like counterspells and usually run at least 8 in my decks with blue, and I'll run more if the win plan is more fragile, such as one that is slow and board based, or a combo without backup options. Counterspells do have their downsides though. There's the holding up mana problem, where if you hold up mana for a potential threat and the threat doesn't materialize, you've effectively wasted mana, as opposed to a removal spell where you can wait for a threat to materialize and then deal with it at your next convenience. Counterspells are still fantastic, and can deal with some higher powered threats that are untouchable by normal removal, but they require a bit more thought to fit into a game plan, and might not be right for all decks. Regardless, it's worthwhile to put in the thought, and to consider what types of interaction will best bolster your win plan, and whether it might be worth it to play a bit more in a given deck. I think it bears mentioning that everything I've said so far in this video is meant in the context of a game where decks are similarly matched in terms of power level, and where players are on the same page about what constitutes a fun game of Magic the Gathering. The most foolproof way to win a game of EDH is to obliterate a bunch of precons with a Godo CEDH deck, so I guess if that's what you clicked on this video for, there you go. But I'd say that sort of gameplay is not interesting for anybody. In addition, for any given card that might be considered a finisher, there will be plenty of players who aren't interested in using it, and others who would rather not play against it, and navigating that is a key step in having fun while playing a casual social format. While this video is about how to win an EDH game, my target audience here is less so decks that are already well-rounded and looking to pump their power level, and more so decks that are doing some cool things, but are struggling to find their way to wins. There's a good chance that improving your deck's ability to win will make it feel more powerful overall, but my point here is simply that you should achieve that by playing to your deck's strengths and improving its internal cohesion, rather than just windmill slamming Crater Hoof Behemoth or Torment of Hailfire into it and calling it a day. I also didn't really discuss combo in this video, because I feel like combos are often conceptually more straightforward than other types of win options since, though you can build a multivalent combo family that can navigate around five different types of stacks effect, on the most basic level, combo decks tend to be more of a yes or no proposition when it comes to winning, compared to a conventional aggro, midrange, or control deck. I also made a full video about combo a while back, and I'll briefly summarize a couple points from that video here. Putting a combo in your deck can be a great way to win a game, but you should accept that if you throw a combo in your midrange deck, if that combo is a lot better than your midrange win plan, you're not playing a midrange deck, you're playing a weird inconsistent combo deck. Below higher powers, the best type of combo to put in your deck will be one that requires some degree of setup, but setup that fits naturally into the rest of the deck's game plan, and whose pieces have alternate use cases in your deck. Combo is basically synergy taken to the extreme, so combos should ideally emerge from trying to optimize your synergies not from throwing Sanguine Bond and Exquisite Blood into a random black deck. To recap some general pointers from earlier, making your deck do a better job of winning will often just mean making sure the inputs and outputs are focused. Keeping your inputs focused typically just means having enough deck cohesion that your deck can launch into a game plan off of its first 10 or 15 cards it draws. You can think of this as having a wide on-ramp. You want as many cards as possible that feel good early, to give your deck the best chances of getting into gear. Keeping your outputs focused means that once your deck gets up and going, the things that it does all contribute to a cohesive game plan that's moving in the direction of victory. If you're making a deck that does a lot of a particular thing, such as discarding cards or sacrificing artifacts, it's tempting to just throw in all sorts of cards that have fun effects when those things happen, but doing that will just add filler that doesn't help you win. Win cons don't exist, in the sense that you're going to have a bad time if you smash together a deck and then throw in a handful of splashy cards at the end for the purpose of winning. But put a bit of thought in from the start of where your deck wants to be going, and you'll have a pretty good chance of getting there.